game fucking sucks and you know I'm right. I always see video essays from nostalgia blinded fucking goobers about how this is one of the best games of all time. And I just have to disagree. They always say shit like, the controls are amazing. Like, how do you say so many words and sentences while also saying nothing that is true? I guess I'll start there. People often say this is one of the best controlling 3D games. Some even go as far as to say it's a gold standard of 3D game control. But this is the first ever 3D platformer by Nintendo. They already struggle with their controls of some of the 2D games. How are they going to get their controls right on their first attempt? Well, the truth is, they don't. First off, much like Mario 1 and Land, there is very little air control, which is already a problem on its own, but as we'll clearly see, that is not the only issue here. The game will also do this weird thing where to avoid immediately turning around in another direction, which could look a little jagged. They make Mario do this circular walking motion instead of immediately turning around. This already isn't a better approach to movement than simply turning around, but the issue becomes more apparent on maps with thinner platforms where it's much easier easier to fall off because of this transition. Mario only does this when he's moving and you make a 90 degree turn which is a little annoying but bearable. But it becomes way, way worse when you start skating. Because no matter which direction you hold, Mario will do the circular motion and it's much more difficult to simply turn around without falling off the platform you're standing on. This problem is also made way, way worse when you take into consideration how shit the camera is in this game. Even fans of the game agree, it's that poorly done. Often you'll try to turn the camera in a different direction and it simply won't for no apparent reason. The camera angles themselves can also be utter shit, like this bridge in wet dry world that has a sideways camera angle that makes it way easier to fall off. It also can't be moved in a full 360 degree angle. The game always increments the camera angle by a good 60 degrees rather than letting you smoothly rotate it to your liking. The camera controls are also inverted by default and can't be changed. They could have easily added an option, but they didn't, and I don't know why games functioned like this back in the day, it's just a weird decision that doesn't affect the quality of the game. Honestly, the only good thing I have to say about the controls is that there's a bunch of cool new additions to Mario's moveset, like long jumps, side flips, back flips, triple jumps, a bunch of new moves. Mario is super versatile. You get a glimpse of how shit the controls are as soon as you get control of Mario 2. You spawn in these little grounds outside the castle, and there's signs scattered around the place teaching you a few basic things about the controls like jumping, climbing, and swimming. This place is meant to be a sort of playground to get used to the controls, and that would be fine. If the controls were good, there's also the smaller qualms I have with the controls, like turning around while underwater being a bit slow, or the turning while sliding being jarringly instantaneous. Flying with the wing cap is just a bit too difficult and unwieldy. And these are all little complaints that just add up to be hands down the worst controlling game so far. The back controls wouldn't even be a huge problem normally. I mean sure, it makes the game less fun and it could lead to annoying moments, but it's whatever, you know. It wouldn't ruin the game. That would be the case if the level design didn't pair with the controls horrifically. The level designs are inconsistent first of all. Some of the levels like Bob on Battlefield and hell even Tall Tall Mountain can be really fun. I especially like Bob on Battlefield, probably the only good stage in the game. But the level designs just in general don't pair very well with the controls and it ends up emphasizing how shit the controls are. I especially remember this being a problem for Womp's Fortress and Lethal Lava Land since there's a lot of thin platforms that don't go well with the less than precise controls of the game and the poor matching leads to a lot of falling. Levels with thin platforms could and have worked in the series before and after this game, but these levels just don't feel like they were built around Mario 64's clunky controls. They feel like they were built around a game with controls that are 10 times better, like Mario 3D World or something. They should have taken design elements from the castle grounds, since again, it's meant to be a sort of playground to get used to the controls. Oh yeah, speaking of the castle, there's a full on hub world for this game in the form of Peach's castle. And look, I'm not even going to try to defend it because it's a massive letdown from Mario World and Mario Land 2 if you ask me. First off, at least to me, it doesn't even look nice. The game in general doesn't look great, but there's a certain charm to the visuals in certain areas that just isn't here. It looks relatively nice in the main area, especially the courtyard, but everywhere else just feels a bit bland, even the basement. Like the basement is different and all, but why is it made out of metal? Everywhere else is made of brown bricks, so I don't really get the point of the metal. And why is there water down here? And better yet, why does the entrance have a curved hallway? 
and honestly there's just this lack of real building architecture it's distinctly a video game world and not remotely immersive because there's just areas that shouldn't be here like these giant hallways that just lead nowhere or these holes in the walls at the third floor that just lead to these tiny rooms with levels in them it's not immersive in the slightest and why is that just this giant fucking clock the pendulum is basically the size of Mario. The castle also just feels empty, even abandoned. There's a few toads and there's booze in the courtyard, but that's basically it. And if there's really just these toads and Peach living here, then first of all, that's depressing, and second, why is there so much space to roam around? Clearly, there isn't going to be too much overcrowding, is there? We've got the immersion out the way, but does Peach's castle at least feel easy to navigate? Eh, mostly. The first room and the basement are easy to navigate, but the second and third floor have weird design quirks that make the map slightly less fun to navigate. The second floor doesn't even have anything that gets in the way, but the fact that the painting that leads the tall to a mountain, which is one of the best levels in the game, is tiny, is a little dumb. This painting is barely bigger than Mario, yet entering it leads to a level, which is really dumb. And the third floor just has the dumbest design floor. As previously mentioned, there's these holes on the each side of the room that lead to level entrances. But the holes are so stupidly high up, I don't even think a triple jump can reach them. You have to use a side flip or a triple jump to get on this platform and then jump through, which is already a little more effort than you realistically should need to put in. But then this hole doesn't even lead to a good level as it leads to Rainbow Ride, which is the 3D equivalent of a fucking auto-scroller. If this sounds pedantic as shit, that's because it is. That's what this game is full of, a bunch of minor annoyances, and after a few hours of playing the anchor adds up. But at least the level designs are easy on their own. Let me talk about the weakest part of the levels, that being the power stars. In each level, there's six different missions that when completed reward you with the star, which I used to unlock new levels, most prominently balance levels. And I'ma be real, <laughs> most of these suck. A lot of these stars are either ambiguous as to how you're meant to get it or just flat out too hard. Like this star in the very first level, needing you to grand pad on this pole to let the chomp free and get the star. First off, it's centered around a move that most people wouldn't even know existed beforehand, considering the game never tells you about the ground pound. But this would be completely fine if there was a sign nearby telling you, the player, about the ground pound. And there's also nothing to let you know that you gotta hit the pole in the first place. And then there's this one, this one's my favorite, where you have to use a cannon in Womp's Fortress to fire out this random ass power and this random ass wall to break it and find the star. Who the hell is gonna do that? Nobody, that's who. Because there's nothing nearby to tell you what to do, no indicator as to what you're supposed to hit, no signs, no nothing. It's even worse that you have to use the cannons, as added on from the shit depth perception is the unpredictable trajectory of the cannons. All they needed was to add a little indicator showing where you're gonna land, but clearly Nintendo didn't give a shit. There's also these names attached to the missions, like Watch for Rolling Rocks, but these often don't give you any hints as to what you're meant to do. You have to go through this valley and avoid the boulders, but after that you have to wall jump here and find the star. Huh? Nothing tells you that it's up here, it just is and you meant to find it. I mean really, all they needed to do was put a platform here instead of the door in this mission specifically, but all other missions have the default door. It's really that simple, as the game already has things that change in certain missions, namely the ship in Darley Roger Bay floating atop the water after the first star, or the tower at the top of Worm's Fortress after once again getting the first star. Actually, hold on, let me just mention something pertaining to that too. So when the collector start to finish the mission and the game needs to add stuff for the next level missions, it will kick you at the level, which is a decent way to transition to the new version of the level. But why on earth am I kicked out of the level for collecting a star that doesn't even change the level in any way? I mean, quite literally, they could have just had an option pop up asking if you want to stay in the level for normal stars. So you can say to get more without getting kicked out and also willingly leave the level if you have all the size you need. It's a really simple option they easily could have added. I mean, the size you get in the hub world already appear with the save option, so they could have just taken that and made it exit the level instead, and apply it to all the stars that don't change the level. It's such an easy addition, and it's such a dumb decision that's not here in the first place. Levels are also just really inconsistent once again. While I don't think many of them really fit into Mario's control scheme, some of these levels are really amazing, like Bob on Battlefield and Tall Tall Mountain, while some of them are just terrible, like Tick Tock Clock and again, Rainbow Ride. This wouldn't be such an issue if you didn't have to play every level, but you probably do because the average person isn't going to collect all the stars in one specific stage. They're probably just going to move on to other levels. But when you reach the Bowser level of the floor you're on, you're gated out of progression unless if you have enough stars. 
This is fine for the first Bowser level considering you have access to 4 levels and you only need 8 stars to get through. And that's a perfect number considering there's 6 stars on each level. But on the second and third Bowser levels you'll probably need to backtrack and get more stars than previous levels. Which is always annoying and should never be in your video game. It's sort of worth it because the Bowser levels are some of the best in the game. But by the end you're going to be pretty annoyed. Because these Bowser fights might be the worst in the series so far. Yes, even worse than Mario 1. Because at least that didn't waste your time. These will always put you in one of two moods. Annoyed or just not having any sort of fun. These Bowser fights are simple but somehow really fucking infuriating. You gotta pick him up by the tail and spin the joystick in a circle to build momentum and throw him into these bombs. This concept could be pretty decent if it were refined but in this game the challenge comes from hitting the bombs in the first place. Grabbing his tail is super fucking easy. You just have to circle Bowser until you have the opportunity. But throwing him is really fucking precise. It's basically impossible to do in one throw. This is especially a problem in the last fight. In the first I just spun Bowser around at a moderate pace to get a little bit of distance and be able to aim much better, so I could just inch Bowser towards the bombs rather than hitting him in one throw. But in the final fight that's the only option for the first two hits, because the areas in front of the bombs break off so you have to build enough speed to get enough distance, at the cost of having to do a normal throw, which is again, really fucking precise. And guess what, it took me like 8 tries to do it! This final boss might be the worst boss in the series purely just because of how fucking impossible it is to hit the bombs. Bombs. and when you're done it also doesn't even feel satisfying. The whole catalogue of bosses is just weak as a whole. A lot of the time they're really easy or just not fun at all. King bob is the first boss and considering this is the first mission of the level he isn't that bad, but still kinda bad. He walks towards you and throws you in a random direction if you get close enough. That's basically it. If you throw him off the arena that is the top of the mountain the fight resets, which is a little up but I'm fine with it since I don't think anyone's going to be losing this. He can never damage you directly, full damage is basically the only thing that can make you lose, which is likely to never happen. To damage him you have to pick him up and throw him really anywhere except off the mountain. After being damaged 3 times you win the fight, and I don't even think a person who's just playing video games for the first time would lose here. The Womp King is next and he's also not that good. Like the Womp enemy this guy is based off of, he'll slam his face onto the ground and then attempt to hit you, and to damage him you have to ground pound on his back when he's on the ground. It's a fine idea but someone really needs some backup enemies to make it harder because it's still too easy. In Big Boo's Haunt you can find the next boss, King Boo. And what do you fucking know, it's really easy, wow. You just gotta grand pen them from behind three times to win. It's not that fun though, you have to fight him three times in this stage which I question the decision of since it's the same every time and makes it basically a waste of a level. Hey at least you get three stars. I haven't fought all the bosses in the game and maybe there's something to write home about for those bosses, but I really can't be bothered playing more of this game to find out. There is another character that could technically be considered a boss since you have to go against him, but he's more of a mini game and that's Cooper the Quick. You can find him on the second mission of Bob on Battlefield and as his name implies, it's a goal to race him to the top of the mountain. And this dude just kinda sucks. <laughs> it's a neat concept for a star but he's just way, way too easy. A lot of stars just use the exact same concept too, like the red coin stars. As the name implies you have to grab 8 different red coins around the stage to get the star. This is a fine concept for a star but there's one red coin star at level and I'm not too big on that. While I think the red coin stars are used too much, I don't think the different caps are used enough. While of course you have your standard Mario cap, you can swap it out for the others for a short amount of time given you have them unlocked and you can unlock them by doing certain stages based entirely around that power up. In these stages you can find these buttons that unlock the corresponding cap and and much like the switch power system in Mario World, they stay unlocked for as long as you have the save file. And these different caps sort of work like power ups to give you certain abilities, but rather than make the game easier, they used to get certain stars that need set abilities. The wing cap is the cap most people will unlock first, and as the name implies, it can take off and fly around. It's not the most creative idea out there, and they failed so hard in the execution. Despite it being a literal flying power up, you can't go much higher than the spot you took off, and you'll often stall out making it a nightmare to use. I honestly would have been pretty mad that they didn't get this right but I swear this one is using like 4 missions throughout the entire game so it doesn't even matter that much. 
the next one is the Vanish Cap, probably the least popular, probably because it doesn't have anything special about it. Grabbing it will make you invisible and allow you to walk through certain walls, but that's basically it. It's more creative than the Wing Cap, but it's way less broad and versatile, meaning you can't do much beyond just using it to walk through walls. The last one, and arguably the most iconic, is the Metal Cap. This one allows you to be completely impervious to everything while it's active, walk underwater instead of swimming, and most importantly, stop being affected by water currents. Overall, these are all fine power-ups. I think they could have been touched up a bit though. With the wing cap, they could have refined the controls a ton and allowed a higher peak height. With the vanish cap, they could have maybe added an extra ability, like adding an extra floaty jump or a double jump. And with the metal cap, they could make the jump lower to emulate heavier objects and maybe have puzzles that surround that downside, but have the metal cap be mandatory to progress, which could make it a lot more interesting to use. Honestly though, I think that my biggest complaint with them is that again, they're super underutilized. I can only think of about like 6 missions that make use of these. Obviously, there's a little more than that, but they really aren't used as often as they realistically should be, especially considering you have to unlock them. I really thought Nintendo would make use of these more throughout the game, considering they have their own stages dedicated to them, but I guess I shouldn't have expected anything from this game. Honestly, I'm kind of noticing a theme from this game, and that's that there's always really cool ideas that end up being executed horribly. Like Tiny Huge Island, it's a really fun concept for a level with having two versions of the map, big and small, that you can switch between by going into these pipes. That's a great idea, but it's executed pretty poorly considering it's faster to get places when you're big, but as a downside it's infinitely more infuriating to navigate. But I think the peak of this shit execution has gotta be the 3D environment itself. Some of these levels take advantage of the new dimension super well like Bobman Battlefield, but some of these levels like TikTok Clock feel way more frustrating with the advent of the third dimension, and it just feels like an extra thing to take into account when jumping around the levels rather than a fun new addition that adds new gameplay and exploratory opportunities. There's also just generally a lot of minor things that are complete bullshit in the game. Like in Shifting Sandland, one of my least favorite levels, there's these bits of quicksand that on contact just kill you instantly, and I just don't get the point in that. Or well, game overs in general. In previous games, they would just send you back to the start of the game, but here getting a game over just sends you outside the castle. Like honestly, even though I hated the game over system in the previous games, I honestly kind of hate it more here because at least in those games, it didn't feel like a waste of time. In this game, the fear of getting a game over is almost non-existent and it just serves to be a minor annoyance rather than send you back to the start but you get a high score, which was basically half the goal of games back then. I don't even know why they're here if they do basically nothing. It's just a strange decision that they're here in the first place. If I had to mention anything good about Mario 64, since I really haven't complimented the game once in this review, it'd probably be the present. While this game objectively doesn't look very good and Mario looks like an Alibaba item that costs 5 bucks, there's a certain charm to the whole look of the game. And on the thematic elements, I have to say, the level themes are pretty boring for the most part. I like Womp's Fortress and TikTok Clock, but the rest of the themes are either pretty generic or thematically ambiguous. Like in Wet Dry World, there's this sunken town section completely segmented from the rest of the level, and I'm not really sure what the rest of this level is meant to be, honestly. It just feels like scattered platforms with no rhyme or reason. And with Rainbow Ride, the description I just gave to Wet Dry World applies here more than it does there. At least that level had the skybox in the sunken town to go off of. This just has nothing, it's literally just a handmade obstacle course. And with the levels I haven't mentioned yet, they're just snow level or mountain level. Though the graphical and thematic presentation wasn't perfect, the soundtrack fills that void completely. My god, there's so many good songs here. I'd say it's a little overrated, but it's still pretty great all around. Bob on Battlefield has a great song, same with the water levels. It's great how the general sound of the songs matches with the areas, like the cool cool mountain or the fucking Curse of Ra theme for Shifting Sandland. And while the soundtrack isn't nearly as good as Mario World's, I don't even think I have to say that. I think the credits theme might be the best in the series. It legitimately gave me goosebumps while listening, and I don't even like this game. And it's a great way to wrap the whole thing up. But yeah, that's Super Mario 64. What the fuck happened here? I'm sorry, was making a good game too hard for you? Okay, to be fair, this was one of the first 3D games and one of the first 3D platforms, so the window for fucking up was extremely large. But I didn't think they'd fuck it up this bad. When you're making a 3D platformer, what you should prioritize over levels, graphics, music, story, everything in the game, 
is how the game controls and they clearly didn't understand this. I may end up liking it more in future playthroughs, but as of now, I think I hate this game. I'm totally fine with people liking this game, really. Just don't shove it down my throat. It's already the highest regarded game of all time, so stop sucking its dick for once and play something else. <laughs> I wouldn't even say terrific or even one of the worst games of all time, but I think all of the poor decisions and terrible executions on otherwise good ideas brings this game down to being objectively mediocre at best. And I think the only reason people like it today is because of nostalgia bias, and yet they somehow like the game so much that this year as one of the best games of all time. It's not. I know I sound like a huge asshole when talking about this, but playing this and even writing about this put me in a bad mood. It's not my fault. Mario 64 is going just above the bottom of the list. Fucking hell. At least Mario 64 has good aspects, and it does set itself apart too, which is what puts it above the lost levels. But Mario 1 is a less unbearable to play, which puts it above. This game put me in a really shit mood, and I'm about to be in an even worse mood because the next game is... <sighs> if a nuke hasn't arrived outside my house for my hatred of Mario 64, it'll definitely arrive for my dislike of this game. Mario Sunshine has always been one of the more contentious titles when it comes to the Mario franchise, and I can't see why. Mostly because I think everyone should hate this game. If you haven't played Mario 64 yet, I'd honestly pass on it because you're very likely to find very little enjoyment from this game if you don't have nostalgia for it. If you're thinking of getting the Nintendo Switch Online expansion pass to play this game, don't. Just don't. Man, I'm really not holding up too well with this. This marathon was really fun until I reached this game and I think we might be heading downhill. Well, might as well get it over with. Thank you so much for playing my game.